On this Valentine's Day, I think it's appropriate for me to restate my love for the neutron. <laughs> it's also approaching her 90th birthday by reckoning. This past, this coming Thursday will be the day that James Chadwick wrote his letter to nature announcing her discovery. So at 90 years old, she and I are about as contemporary as the president of France and his wife. <laughs> uh, though the neutron is ever fresh, if you encounter one, it's a newborn because the lifetime of the neutron in the wild is 15 minutes. That means if you do see a neutron, it's a result of a radioact, a radiogenic event that has occurred near you and close to you in time. And the neutron might arguably be the most quantum of all the particles that are in use by virtue of the fact that it, it's easily cooled to room temperature or even lower. When a neutron has about the same mass as a proton, when they collide, the, the proton is bound in water or something. The most energetic neutron, you lose a good fraction of its energy. So this has been, uh, and also since the neutrons in application are typically coming out of reactor sources, they, they are at room temperature. And there they only undergo S wave collisions with nuclei. Uh, this, was, this was discovered by Fermi, who explained it by introducing the concept of scattering length that is like the enabling technology of ultra-cold atomic physics. Uh, Mike uh, trained at uh, Kalamazoo College and then at Tulane University did his PhD thesis work on various types of neutron scattering experiments performed at the National Institute of Standards and Technology in Boulder, Colorado, and has you know, since become the lead investigator on the neutron optics and interferometer facility. It's, I think, perhaps the only place in the United States where neutron interferometry is practiced at, at a significant degree. And he's responsible for building a fabulous new beam line the design of which was motivated by some concepts associated with quantum information theory. Though the critics say, well, it's just common mode rejection. Nevertheless, it's, uh, what do you call it? Decoherence free subspace. And uh, there's some amazing work done. Well, it's probably done during the past five years, but first reported uh, just this past uh, autumn. And uh, he's here to tell us about it. Thank you, Charles. Uh, yes, yeah, so like as Charles said, I'm from NIST. I run the two interferometry instruments that we have up there. Uh, when you think about neutron interference, you usually talk, are talking about single crystal neutron interferometry, which is pictured here using a perfect crystal. Um, that's actually relevant to this experiment. We'll get into that a little bit later, but we're doing a sort of a new type of interference uh, called pendulosin in measuring the phase shift due to that. Um, before I begin, I'd like to say that like the main driver of all this work is basically um, Ben Heacock, who's sitting in the audience. Uh, he's been the, uh, the lead on this. I'm just happy enough to talk about it as a senior researcher, as they tend to call me sometimes now. Okay, so before we get in the weeds, and we will get in the weeds because it's Pendelosin. So this is the overview of what we want to do, and we, what, what we get out of it. And so uh, it's essentially looking for weak interacting forces on sort of the nanometer scale. And if you're looking for new forces, one way to parameterize it is given here, where a uh, common way is you have a, a strength of the potential, which is called alpha, and you have a length scale along the uh, horizontal axis in which that is uh, applicable. Um, you can see in the green region is every experimental exclusion of these two parameters. And note that uh, these go several orders of magnitude, both directions. So there's a really large parameter space 
And um, there's a wealth of different types of experiments that are sensitive to different regions to this plot, right? So torsion balances, which are used uh, in the measurement of Newton's gravitational constant, those are also really good at measuring these types of forces on the millimeter scale. Um, what we would like to do is we're gonna use neutron interacting with a crystal lattice, specifically silicon, uh, to explore the region on the nanometer scale, which is right in sort of the armpit of this excluded region. region. Um, the great thing about this technique is it's not uh, just a one-off shell, is that uh, it actually gives you uh, stuff beyond the new physics aspect of this work. Uh, it informs you what the silicon atoms are doing actually within the lattice, how they're vibrating, and how strongly they thermally vibrate in the lattice. Um, and actually, kind of amazingly, it actually informs you on what's happening in the internal structure of the nucleon as well. Um, and that uh, is one of the more exciting aspects to me. I will say it's very challenging to talk about this, or historically we've, I think, had a little bit of stumbling when talking about this uh, project. Um, and the challenges, I've sort of listed them here, but the big one, one, it's a unique probe. It's a neutron, which is not familiar to a lot of people. It's not electrons, it's not X-ray scattering, it's not atomic fountains. Um, it might be more understood in this room and the people listening because of the reactor locally here and also at NIST, but in general audiences, they don't know why a neutron is useful. The other thing is it's really obscure technique. So we're gonna use pendulosin interference. Even within neutron scattering, this technique is not used. Um, it's a demonstrative experiment because it's predicted by theory, but um, it's not used. And I'll get to why no one uses it later in my talk. And then the third challenge is the challenge of impact. So the impacts are sort of broad. At one aspect you have beyond the standard model searches, like looking for a new fifth force, you have uh, information about crystal dynamics and how the phonons scatter within a silicon lattice. It's a totally different set of people who are interested in that. And then you have nuclear line structure, which is a totally different group of people, usually uh, just plain nuclear physicists. And so that's my challenge. And hopefully I do a good job of explaining this experiment and, and the impact that it has. Um, so the neutron, okay, we're all familiar with the neutron as a concept, but why are, is it useful? And why are the properties of the neutron is useful? So one is, the first one is like the most important, it's neutral charge, which might seem kind of like, oh, it's a neutron, of course it's neutral charge, but this is like the fundamental most important property. Because it's neutral charge, it can interact deeply within materials, okay? It can penetrate materials, so it can study bulk uh, properties of materials, and that's the number one reason it's used. Okay. In fact, the experiment that I'm describing here, uh, there's a analog of doing it with x-rays. And in x-rays, you have strong absorption within the silicon crystal. So they're restricted to using a thin silicon crystal to do their pendulosin measurements. Here in the neutron case, we're not restricted by that. We can use a thick crystal, which means we can accumulate a greater phase shift and therefore achieve uh, high precision measurement. Uh, it's versatile. Um, it interacts with all known forces of, of matter, usually, actually about at the same length scale. Um, it decays, uh, which is awfully useful. Um, like Charles mentioned, it's got a, a lifetime of about 15 minutes, which turns out to be a half-life of about 10 minutes. Um, these are important parameters in if you want to study precision beta decay because it's the simplest um, thing that uh, beta decays and you can do uh, high precision tests with standard model using it. Um, more useful uh, in terms of higher impact or not higher impact, but uh, more broadly useful is that it's a, got a magnetic dipole, which means it's a tiny little magnet. It, for most neutron sources, it's gonna provide a de Broglie wavelength on the range of two angstroms to 10 angstroms, which is useful for interatomic spacing. And it has a noticeable index of refraction. Those three properties allow it to be used in condensed matter physics. And that's the driving force of a lot of neutron experiments. Not this one particularly, but it is an important stepping soul. Does have spin. Can you comment on that magnetic dipole, the sign and the magnet, the comparable magnetic program? Yeah, uh, it is, it's close to the proton. Uh, the sign just actually, it, it can be interpreted, it is, is in the opposite direction of the spin of the neutron. So uh, obviously when you're doing sort of mu, mu dot B interaction, um, signs don't really matter all that much, but it, it's opposite uh, sign is the spin. So if you're doing a spin 
magnetic, it becomes important. Um, and uh, lastly, it's a composite material. It's not a fundamental object in it of itself, like an electron. Uh, as far as we know, it doesn't have an electric dipole moment, but that is like a, a super major effort in the US to me try to measure that. And internationally, I think in the US, it's a, about a, uh, you know, like a hundred million dollar effort at this point. Uh, and the charge radius, which I'll get to uh, later, which is describing it as a um, sort of a charge distribution within the, in the particle itself. So uh, source-wise, yeah, where do we get the neutrons? Where are the neutrons coming out? Charles talked uh, a little bit on this, but we use the, uh, what's called the NBSR reactor, which is the National Bureau of Standards Reactor up in uh, NIST. Uh, it uses our old name because relicensing uh, reactors is, uh, is a pain in the butt. So they keep the old name. Um, so it uses uh, here these vertical rods. Let's keep this. Oh, this laser pointer is a little stucky. So you have these rods coming up and down. Those contain the uranium uh, that fissions, creating a, a nice spectrum that is uh, around uh, about a one mega electron volt comes out of the uh, fission of uranium. Uh, that's not useful for one, uh, having a, uh, a sustained chain reaction, and two, any of sort of neutron experiments you could think of. And so they use a moderator, and at NIST, we use DTO as our moderator, but you can use um, light water or you can uh, use even graphite. Um, that shifts all the neutron energies down to more usable uh, uh, 20 milli electron volts, so six orders of magnitude, and peaks around two ang angstroms. And sort of the Sam Werner rule of two, uh, it's just an easy thing to remember when you're dealing with neutron scattering experiments is that uh, an energy of 20 milli electron volts is about two angstrom wavelength and a speed of about 2.2 kilometers per second. So not particularly fast relative to light. It turns out uh, though that those uh, neutrons at two angstrom are really useful, but you do want to shift it even farther down to do more condensed matter searches. And so at NIST, we use uh, a cold moderator, which for us currently is liquid hydrogen. Uh, that's gonna get changed in about a year to uh, deuterium. Uh, but uh, that shifts the neutron spectrum into the cold region. And so on the scale here, you can sort of see the, the range of usable wavelengths that we use in energy. So typical neutron experiments are in the cold and just into the green peak of to about two angstroms. It doesn't really, usefulness uh, falls off pretty fast there. And then at the really high uh, or low end of energy, you have uh, what's called ultra cold neutrons. Those are neutrons that are moving so slow, you can basically uh, just walk, uh, you can outrun them. Um, so just generally why neutrons are interesting um, and why there's so many facilities around the world that use them. The number one is material science, which is not my bag of tricks, but uh, it pays or it keeps the lights on basically. It allows us to do sort of more interesting fundamental physics uh, measurements. And so uh, the experiment pictured here on the, on the upper left is an experiment just to measure the um, change in electrical resistance as for a, a topological material as a magnetic field is varied. Um, then um, a little bit uh, sort of in the material, but uh, 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 side, but a little bit more practical or, uh, is the imaging. So neutrons are very good at imaging uh, objects. And they use the fact that the neutron sees hydrogen very strongly. And so it's very sensitive to organic compounds, water. And so you can study for the, uh, for instance, the uh, inorganic compounds in shale. You can look at the water uh, retention in fuel cells. And in batteries, you can actually track uh, the lithium as, as the lithium moves as you discharge a battery, because lithium is also another strong absorber of neutrons. For UCN, which are more or less just used in fundamental neutron physics, uh, you can do two really cool things. One if, is on the bottom left. So a neutron placed between two, uh, two plates, an ultra cold neutron placed between two plates will basically bounce. Uh, those bounces are described uh, by airy functions and not classically. So as you bury the height of these two plates, uh, classically you would accept, ex, expect a straight line here, it's MGH, um, and, but the uh, actual probability you measure is related to the uh, functions drawn. Um, and by vibrating the uh, bottom plate, they can induce transitions into the different energy states. Another very useful thing for UCNs is they're moving so slow, you can actually just trap them within a material bottle. 
Um, that's are usually used in neutron lifetime measurements, precision measurements of that quantity. Uh, the latest uh, uh, trap of this type actually uses a uh, uh, Hallbach array to have strong magnetic fields to hold the neutrons in place. Uh, but uh, that result was published recently and is the most first. Oh, yeah, question. Thank you. Yes. Uh, well, and <laughs> yeah, so I'll tell you the resolution for these images are on the tens of micron range. That's about as good as you can get for the neutron camera, and we're limited to about the same for the X-ray camera. Um, these actually are taken at the same time. Or, uh, at NIST, we have the capability of both doing an X-ray and neutron measurement uh, 90 degrees uh, from each other. So we can take images of, of the same object, 90 degrees relative, and then we can uh, in post, combine the two images. Um, and so, hmm? uh, I'm not quite sure because it's not my. It's not practical. No, that's not practical. Yeah. So, I'd like to ask about the, the plot. The, the one that's labeled gravity, the yes. Energy, the energy. So, are these like particle of lock energies in a gravitational field, or is there something more going on here? Yes, essentially, that's okay. all they're doing. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. So, um, okay. So, uh, getting back to just neutron data that's relevant to this experiment. Uh, okay. So, first of all, uh, it's a Dubois wavelength, which is related to its k vector. But the important thing is. Uh, the scattering length. And so the potential of the neutron interacting with the nucleus of an atom is described by this potential. Uh, and the only real factor uh, it depends on is one, the density of the material, which is not so big, uh, big of a deal, but uh, it's uniquely interaction is determined by this, what's called the scattering length. Um, it varies wildly across the isotope table, and it is totally isotope dependent. There's a couple just cherry pick there, but you can see that hydrogen has uh, uh, minus 3.7 scattering length, while deuterium, uh, just the very next thing on the chart, uh, has a positive that's twice as large, okay? Um, it does, being a neutron, it does experience an index reflection, which is the same as optical uh, light. The only real difference, uh, practical difference, is that for optics, you know, when you pass through an object, usually the uh, using index of refraction is on the order of 1.3, 1.4, something like that. For neutrons, it differs from one by just a part in a couple million. Uh, so it's a very weak interaction, but it's a very important interaction. And we can see all the differences there. Okay, so that's with scattering lengths. Okay, how are we, what are we doing? We're measuring a phase. Um, and so, if you have a neutron coming in with a crystal lattice with nice repeating lattice planes that are, are the little blue horizontal lines, uh, if you're not on Bragg, if you're just coming in, you're just going to pick up a phase shift that is proportional to this index of refraction, which would be something like this. You get a phase shift. Uh, here's the index of refraction part of it with the uh, scattering length. Um, and it's a relatively large phase shift because like 100 microns of aluminum, which is a non-absorbing, totally transparent object that we can put in an interferometer, uh, that's about uh, 100 microns is about two pi. So you can pick up phase really, really quickly. Um, this is sort of the traditional use of uh, maybe a perfect, uh, perfect crystal neutron interferometer is to measure scattering lengths via this relationship with phase. But that's off Bragg, okay? So what we're doing for Pendelosin, it's a Bragg scattering experiment um, because we wanna study what the four or the interaction is with respect to Q. And so if you're on Bragg, you can describe Bragg's law, of course, in uh, two simple ways, either algebraically or vector, uh, either way works. Oops, I'm going too fast. Um, 
So you have an internal wave vector K0, you have a uh, diffracted vector KH, um, and you have in a relationship uh, given by your Hamiltonian of two equations um, that you have to solve for. And because those equations uh, contain squared terms, essentially, uh, you actually not get two solutions, but you get four solutions. Okay. And so this is where the sort of magic happens in Bragg scattering for single crystals. And so you get what's called uh, traditionally labeled the alpha solution and the beta solution. Uh, the alpha solution is actually a neutron standing wave that is passing through the spaces in between the lattices. And the beta wave corresponds to the neutrons actually passing through the node. So they're like maximally interacting with the, uh, the atomic nuclei while the alpha states are basically passing through. If you measure a phase, you actually get something that looks like this. And I apologize, that's in radian sense degrees. It's a huge phase shift. Um, and if you zoom in on this phase shift uh, as a function of, of angle, oh, and I should say this delta, because the Bragg case has a certain width, you don't have to be exactly on Bragg. You can be off by a few arc seconds and still satisfy the Bragg condition because there's a width to that acceptance. And so what these are plots are the phase as a function of this um, offset parameter where zero would be exact Bragg. Um, but in the blow up of the phase, you can see these little wiggles and that's due to the interchange, the, the beating between the alpha and beta state solutions within the crystal and that's pendulosum, okay? So that uh, is sort of what we're going to be trying to measure, um, not in this particular layer, um, case, but it, it, we do it a little bit differently. Um, again, a uh, different kind of picture of the same thing uh, where you can see the for silicon, the 2-2-O uh, Bragg planes, which are these uh, grayish areas, and the alpha and beta states forming essentially standing wave patterns within them. Uh, this is uh, an example of self-interference. Our count rates are super low. Uh, if, you, if you notice on the slide with the um, the reactor and spectrum, the reactor was equal to one Christmas light bulb. That is a true statement. We do not have a high flux source. This is a 20 megawatt re reactor, but it's equivalent to a Christmas light bulb in terms of light output. So our source is not very hot. Um, because of that, we know there's one neutron in the uh, lattice at, at a time, and that <clears throat> means all these, uh, it's, it's being shared between these four state solutions, okay? I'll also note that in X-ray scattering, uh, the beta state maximally interacts with the lattice or with the lattice and the atoms in the lattice. So it's interacting with the electric fields very strongly. So in an X-ray case, an X-ray interferometer or, um, or an X-ray under Bragg condition, uh, basically the beta state gets absorbed very quickly and you don't get it uh, after a while. It's all becomes just alpha state. But for the neutron case, this is not true because the neutron is not strongly absorbed by the uh, electric fields of the, uh, of the lattice. Could you just say yes. a little bit, I mean, uh, for those of us who, who study Bragg scattering, when, you know, 50 years ago, uh, <laughs> and people were talking about x-rays, uh, so what's different here? That is the, uh, I don't remember two solutions, and, but, but it, I mean, how different can it be? <laughs> it's not different at all. So the only difference really is in for the x-ray case, because the beta state is absorbed, Essentially, at one point, they just ignore it. Uh -huh. If you look at it like a real tracy of how they derive dynamical diffraction, which describes all this nit and gritty, uh, in the x ray case, they actually go in a lot more detail because for them, they're really sensitive on strain gradients and, and they bend in crystals and all that kind of stuff. For the neutron case, it's not as important for us. Um, so, uh, but for them, yes, essentially, if you look at the literature, They'll always break in an alpha beta states, but at some point they just ignore the beta states because they're absorbed. Well, so. is a, is a neutron, uh, you know, get higher visibility because the index is so close to one. Is that a, that a under there? Well, you have to, yeah, well, you have to remember that what the x-rays are interacting with are the electric fields of the atoms and the atomic, you know, the, uh, the electrons. Right, the neutron is not the case, right? So essentially, uh, even the beta waves are interacting just with the nucleus, and that's just a weak scattering and it's a non absorption process. So it is kind of different um, than the x ray case from a, fu a fundamental standpoint. 
Um, but the, yeah, this is all worked out. It was worked out in x-rays 10 years before it was worked on, on neutrons. Um, we, we tend, neutron case tends to follow the x-rays by a couple decades from what they're doing compared to what we're doing. Um, and uh, that's just been the historic rule. Uh, one other thing I mentioned about Bragg scattering and dynamical diffraction that is not often talked about, but it's a little bit of a key point in here uh, uh, for why pendulosin isn't widely used. Um, I said, uh, let's just look at the currents of the neutron as it passes through the crystal. Okay, so at the extremes, uh, you form uh, what is called the Borman triangle. So this is uh, sort of the extreme case, uh, but if you're exactly on Bragg, what happens is the current basically transmits completely parallel to the crystal lattice planes, okay? Um, if you're off Bragg by this delta, which again is just a, like an arc second, uh, you will excite uh, the edges of the Borman fan. You can't go outside of the Borman fan, but you can be anywhere inside of it as a, as a current, okay? And typically uh, they like to use this omega as the angle within the, uh, the crystal relative to the lattice plane. Uh, the tricky thing is that um, there's an angle amplification effect. So if you're just a little bit off, if you're not one arc second, but now we're talking milli arc seconds off of Bragg, then the uh, neutron uh, density, current density actually uh, goes at an angle in between uh, the two other extreme cases. And that angle omega is still there, However, that angle of omega is multiplied by a million times whatever this delta is. And so even for small deviations, the neutron very quickly prefers going on the edges of the Borman fan. I'll get to why that's important in a second. The other thing to note uh, is something I can't really or haven't been able to avoid is that uh, when they talk about this uh, in dynamical diffraction, they like to eliminate the fact that the crystal is distance. And so they refer to the exit outgoing beam as always by uh, these two unit list parameters, gamma and minus gamma, which are sort of the edges of the Borman fan. Um, that's sort of uh, something I can't get around quite yet, but uh, it's very common. Okay, so what does the beams actually look at like when we actually look at uh, the measured intensity? Um, again, uh, we have the equations, which are just uh, Bessel functions. Uh, the solutions to the outgoing incident waves. Um, it fills a neutron coming in. If it has enough uh, um, coherence, it will fill the whole Borman fan. It comes out sort of wiggly. Um, the two key points I want to point out for this, this plot one is that we can define a pendulosin length uh, with the equation here, which is related to the volume of the unit cell of the, uh, the silicon atoms, the lambda of the neutrons being used, the Bragg angle, and what this is structure factor. And this structure factor is ultimately what we care about. It's not pendulosin length, it's the structure factor we wanna measure. And you can see uh, the influence of pendulosin in these oscillations in the outgoing curves. And this is for two different values of D over H. I'll go back one, okay. All right, so typically a pendulosin length is on like 30 microns, uh, just to give you a length scale. So, um, this is where the difficulty lies in pendulosin oscillations and why not, it's a technique not uh, widely used. Uh, one, it requires a perfect, sing a, a perfect single crystal. Uh, for us, it's silicon, it's the best thing you can buy for this type of work, uh, but it limits you to what you can do. You can't just take any old piece of material off the shelf. Um, that's a technical challenge. The other two are real practical challenges. Uh, one, the oscillations for the pendulosin, as you can see are rapid, uh, along the edges and they get rapider as they go along, right? Uh, and that's a problem because trying to measure the oscillations at that uh, along the wings of the intensity curve are very difficult because there's a lot happening. Also the problem is the intensity tends to favor the outgoing uh, edges because of this Borman fan and the amp angle amplification. So most of the intensity of the neutron beam coming out is actually at the wings, either minus gamma or plus gamma. Um, and so in order to resolve the pendulosin oscillations, we want to look at near uh, gamma equals zero, but of course that cuts down our intensity by many factors. And so that's essentially why the techniques that use uh, robustly is because you're looking at an area of your uh, intensity uh, for the oscillations that is 
kind of weak intensity overall. So, so what we happen to do is collimate the beams. Yes. Oh. So, so I, I think I understand the uh, uh, the edges of the fan. I mean, the, the this one, the upper edge, is the beam that goes right on through. Sure. Yeah. The other one is the one that gets fragments up. Right. So, what's everything else in between? <laughs> and 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 I'm, obviously that's the main thing because that's where most of the of the flux is. But what, but how does that other stuff get there? Right. So, it's multiple scattering. Right. It's not just scattering off a single atom in this lattice so it's you're right in the in the right, forward peak it's drag is always scattering off multiple planes it's not drag unless it's multiple planes right that's true that's true um but uh in dynamical it takes the part where you can reflect off one plane but then reflect back right right so that's the main difference right so right so why does that move it move the angle because it seems like it should just go back and forth uh, yeah, but it doesn't go back back and forth equally. Um, it's like a gang of like I was like think of Plachinko from uh, uh, Price is Right. You throw a ball in, and and ideally it would come down to the the center, but in, in Bragg's case, it wants to come down to the edges because it can it can positively reflect. Uh, you know, a, a neutron uh, coming out. Uh, let's see, you know, coming out like maybe midway, like gamma equals a half. Might have reflected off a couple of planes positively this way, or not interacted with the planes, but then at the last minute sort of took a bounce and then came out the other way. Yeah, but it has to satisfy the Bragg condition, right? Yeah. So if it satisfies the Bragg condition uh, uh, each time there's a reflection, why does it fill in that one? Oh, well, I'm explaining it poorly. <laughs> so, yeah, you just don't satisfy the Bragg condition as well as the center. So the center yeah, is true, yeah. probability to bounce back and forth. And so they just run down the slot the slot to make the Bragg plane. But on the edges, you've got a lot more neutrons out there because we're, we're hitting it with a broadband source, right? So we're actually using the pixel to cut down on the face, basically. Oh, so the, so the, yeah. the okay. I, I guess the thing that's going in is not monochromatic. No. No, yeah, not yeah. Actually, yeah. it's not. That's just that I was thinking of it in terms yeah. of having a uh, yeah, yeah. bigger wave. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so one of the early observations of pendulous interference uh, was done by Shaw at MIT. Um, and neutron coming in is the same kind of picture. Uh, uh, and what he did was he put an outgoing slit. In this case, it's about 100 micron slit. It's very small. And he's measuring the pendulosin oscillation as a function of uh, one uh, crystal thickness. So this is a, a thicker crystal, thinner, and then thinnest. And then also as a function of wavelength, because he's doing this at a completely white beam source. And so he's putting his crystal right next to the MIT reactor and he can pick up whatever wavelength he wants. And so he's just changing the, essentially the bragging of the crystal selecting out a different momentum. And that's what plotted there. It's just a beautiful example because you can see clearly the oscillations that are going on uh, throughout the process. Um, there's two ways to measure that pattern, right? And so there's the Shaw way, which is the top method, uh, where you're varying the incoming neutron wavelength or, or, or wave vector um, to measure an oscillation. There's an alternative way in which you're rotating the crystal around the Q-axis vector, uh, in which you're still satisfying the same Bragg condition, but now you're effectively changing the thickness of the crystal. And so that also would send you in an oscillation. And that's the method that we use. So we're rotating the crystal in a way that it still satisfies the same Bragg condition, but ultimately um, it's changing its effective thickness as the neutron propagates through, which changes the oscillation. Uh, okay, so what are we measuring? Uh, we're, again, we're interested in the SF Q, which is the structure factor. And what it is, it's essentially the interaction of uh, summed up over a unit cell of the silicon. Okay, so that's a unit cell of a silicon. It's a diamond shaped uh, lattice, which is a bit confusing to draw. Um, and these are the terms that we're interested in. Okay, so the red one is the Debye Waller factor. This has to do with the thermal motion of the, uh, the atoms. Uh, you also get the B nuclear scattering, which is primarily the dominant effect. Uh, you get this other term, which is related to the neutron and electron interaction, which it does have an interaction. Um, and that's called the, uh, ultimately that gives you a charge radius. And then lastly, uh, 
uh, b sub phi, which is another function of q, which give you uh, new forces. Okay, so I'll walk through each of these very quickly. Uh, I think I'll just skip that slide for now. Um, so the nuclear scattering length, that's the easiest one. Actually for silicon, it's the best known nuclear scattering length uh, measurement uh, or, or quantity uh, that we have. It was measured with a neutron interferometer at NIST actually back in the uh, late 90s. Uh, it's a traditional neutron interferometry experiment where you just put the sample in and you measure the phase calls of the sample. And if you know the sample properties well, you can back up the phase shift. So uh, it's very precisely known. We don't actually have to know it to quote a result for this experiment uh, because it will actually will normalize it out. Uh, but it is nice to know for when we're uh, doing sensitivity and, and double checks. The next quantity uh, on that uh, thing that I'll talk about is the neutron charge radius. So the neutron is not, uh, it, although it's neutral, that does not preclude the fact that it has a spherically symmetric charge distribution. And so that charge distribution is reflected here. So you have the definition of the charge radius, which is just the integral of the charge density times R squared uh, over dr. We know that it's less than zero. Um, there's essentially two arguments for that. The early argument of Fermi and Marshall, which I kind of like, it's not technically really correct, but conceptually I like it. Um, they argued uh, back in the um, of, of 50s that basically the neutron itself being a composite would live some of its lifetime as a proton pion pair. They estimated about 20%. So if the neutron's living part of its lifetime as a proton pion pair, then essentially that becomes a hydrogen atom with a pion instead of an electron. And that solution uh, would tend to have a positive core and a negative shell. And that's what we believe the neutron has. And because the, it has a positive uh, core and a negative shell, and you're weighting the uh, a density operator. Ooh, that went really fast. Uh, you're weighting the density operator by R squared. Uh, you'll get a value that's less than zero. Um, there's a better chromodynamic uh, uh, description uh, that favors a negative scattering light or a negative charge radius two that has to do with the fact that there's spin spin forces pushing the down course out to the outer shell. Um, and then being negative charge also gives you the same thing. So the density kind of looks uh, something like uh, what's plotted here. Um, it has been measured. It's usually measured using neutrons uh, because the neutron charge radius has this nicely well-known uh, relationship with the neutron electron scattering length. And that's indeed what uh, in the previous plot we're going to measure in the structure factor. Uh, note that it's a thousand times smaller than the nuclear part, which is why it's challenging to measure in most other experiments, but actually we get a pretty good result here. It's also important in studies of form factors, which is done at places like JLab uh, down in Newport News, Virginia, where they're trying to measure the form factors of nucleons. Um, and there the charge radius becomes essentially the slope of the form factor near Q equals zero. Um, they're not at a point where they can predict a measurement of, Q, of, of, of R squared at this, at Q equals zero, but they usually use it as a, uh, a parameter in their models. Current landscape look like this. There's essentially five values that make up the particle data group's measurement of the charge radius. They're sort of given there. So there's a tiny bit of disagreement, but all in all, pretty good. Uh, and the values uh, up uh, on the upper right corner. Um, I will point out that, oh, uh, wrong button. Uh, all, almost all of these are transmission measurements um, and no one's been doing any of this since about 2000, uh, actually a little bit earlier than 2000. So, uh, okay, speaking about charge rays, we're not the first to sort of propose doing this with uh, pendulosin interference. Uh, so uh, these guys, uh, uh, Scharenberg and Lieb actually proposed doing, uh, doing it using Bragg ref reflection as well. If you look in the literature of what, uh, what uh, Structure factors have been measured for silicon. Uh, there's only been one, and that was Schull, and he did one, one, one uh, back uh, back in the day. Um, and there's nothing else in that table uh, for the X-ray case. The table is almost completely, I guess, filled out with multiple experiments, uh, but not for the neutron case. And the ones in red are the ones that we're tackling in this experiment. There's also the debye wall factor. This is the thermal scattering. The, the, the atom is actually vibrating in space with this sort of thermal excitations. Um, it's this e to the minus w factor, but uh, essentially it comes down to one term, which is this b term uh, times q squared. Uh, 
And so there's measurements in this x-ray case and there's predictions uh, based on uh, theory um, uh, of that number. Um, but we can add to that too. There's a little bit of hint that uh, there might be some issues with calculating phonon scattering in this, these cases. And that has to do with the structure factor uh, corrections that were in one of the earlier uh, neutron papers. Uh, they get led pretty well, done pretty well, but they disagree with bismuth. And that might be a hint that there's something funny going on. Okay, so new forces. Uh, new forces, there's a, um, a lot of theoretical motivation for these. I'm not gonna get into them. I'm not an expert on any of the GR stuff, uh, but uh, either you wanna explain dark energy or a host of other problems with a standard model, uh, you can predict a fifth force that operates on the short length length scale. Again, we're not the first person to propose doing this using drag scattering. That actually came from Green and uh, uh, Um And so uh, the most common parameterization of this is given there with you have just a modification to basically gravity in which you're adding this alpha. Let's see if this works. Alpha e to the minus r over lambda. So alpha is again your strength, and lambda is your effective um, um, range. Um, for the Stilkin case, if you do the uh, Fourier transform, you get this relationship here. So you have a B of Q, uh, which is weighted by some factor, but it's then proportional to what's of interest. So that runs through the terms. Uh, let's talk about the crystal a little bit. I think maybe I'll skip that a little bit, other than the fact that, oops, the crystal that we used, uh, that Shaw used, had um, relatively large uh, strain gradients of about 100 nanorit radians per millimeter. Uh, we know that through neutron optics work that uh, we can do a lot better. Um, so in the fact, the last couple of years, we've spent a lot of time uh, measuring strain gradients and trying to minimize them in neutron interferometers that we have around this. Um, and so we can routinely get down to uh, like four or five uh, nano radians per millimeter stresses, uh, which is much better than the, the, the shell effort. Uh, our sample looked like this. You'll see a couple other pictures of it, but it has this funny shape because it had to have clear reference faces and we had to invert it inside the interferometer. The experiment was a measurement in two parts. So one is to measure pendulosin on the, the left. On the right is to measure the uh, DB0 term. Uh, so the experiment part one uh, simplified. This is all we did. We had the silicon sample. We rotated around the Bragg vector, this theta P. Uh, we fit it to a functional form. Uh, you can see some of the data right there for two of the reflections, one on one's on top, two, two, two is on zero. Uh, notice the low, low count rates. Uh, this is done like, um, like I think 80 minute uh, scans. So uh, very low neutron uh, counts, uh, but we clear oscillation. I think, I think it's 80 minutes for these. 80 minutes per point. Per point, yeah, yeah. And if you, uh, if that shell paper, I just copied, uh, but his was, the scale was a little hard to read on the intensity, but it's neutrons per minute. So he's measuring basically a hertz. We're measuring a little bit more than a hertz. So yeah, low experiment, uh, low intensity experiments. Yes? Oh, there's a, uh, there's a tilt offset. Right. Well, oh, because you, you just don't know. You don't know where your lattice planes really are relative in space, right? So you have to include an offset term because you don't really know what zero is. Zero could be anywhere. Uh, so the fact that we're within like a degree or so is pretty good. That's basically what you can do uh, if you want to measure it with an X-ray before you cut the crystal. Uh, you can get that to accurate to about a degree. So yeah. So not necessarily has to be symmetric around zero. Uh, to do the the D uh, to factor out the nuclear uh, scattering and the thickness of the sample, we did a typical neutron interferometer experiment where we inverted the sample and measured its effective phase shift. Uh, this is a plot of some of the data there, um, and then uh, that gives us the uh, uh, sort of the normalization factor. Uh, results: uh, We measured three of these structure factors: one one one, two two zero, four four four. The one 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 agrees with the early shell measurement, but we have a factor of four better precision. Uh, we're measuring these at about the part in five times 10 to the minus five, which is awfully high precision for us, which is why we can uh, um, say the things that we do. Uh, 
Uh, systematics are all pretty low, and most of these in uh, future efforts will be much lower. Uh, total systematics, you can see, are, uh, uh, dominates our effect. Uh, the interferometry on uh, certain biologic for that part of the experiment uh, contains our largest uh, correction, which is uh, a correction for air scattering because the sample displaces the air that was originally there. We, we don't do these experiments in vacuum. We do in normal, uh, astro, uh, normal conditions. Um, all these can be basically either uh, put to zero or fixed in, in new iterations of this experiment. This is our basically a graph of the charge radius uh, versus the spi factor, the part of the Debye wall factor, because they're, uh, they're correlated. Uh, this is our work uh, at different confidence levels. The large band uh, is the earlier shell work, which was just one, one, one. Um, so there's a slight disagreement between us and maybe uh, the uh, x-ray, uh, but it's not su super large. Uh, there might be something there. Uh, for the charge radius, uh, interesting enough, there hasn't been a lot of new measurements. We're the first new actual measurement of the charge radius in 20 years. Uh, there has been some work on the theoretical side for a Mekairo effective field theory. There's also what is reported as a measurement was kind of quasi measurement. It's this electron scattering, which is the stuff from like uh, Jefferson Lab. Okay, so we think uh, this program, if we continue it by measuring uh, different structure factors and additional to doing other things, that we can cut down the uncertainty to something that you can see there. And at that point, we're making real sort of um, definitive measurements. Um, here, we're just one of many, so or one of a few. For the uh, fifth force limits, I mean, surprise we didn't find a new force of nature. You know, I think you might have heard about that if we had. Um, we put uh, the, the limit in that sort of armpit uh, near the uh, angstrom level to a couple tens of angstroms um, is the purple value there. Uh, you see it's the best limit in all those cases. Um, and so where are we going from here? I guess I have like maybe a couple more minutes. I'll just finish up. There's a lot more structure factors to measure. Uh, we're going to continue doing it uh, at higher orders, particularly, which requires not cold neutrons, but hot neutrons. Uh, we're going to measure germanium, which is a you know kind of a sister crystal of silicon. It has a higher Z, so you get more of the uh, neutron electron scattering. Um, and then uh, we can also do it when the sample is held at different temperatures, and that can isolate the wall wall factors. The first two of those are uh, actively happening right now. This is uh, the NIST reactor is shut down right now, so we took our effort uh, to SNS, which is the uh, Oak Ridge neutron source uh, in Tennessee. It's a pulse source, and there we can actually measure higher order structure factors at the same time because it's it's shooting us with all the neutrons or a wide swath at the same time. We don't have to monochromate the beam. We have that through the timing information of the pulse. Um, it requires uh, no measurement of the the uh, um, the interferometer type, the single crystal type, and it has a uh, different set of systematics. So we're super excited about this. We just started this program. Uh, it's also very sensitive to anaromatic contributions. So these are different phonon modes within the silicon crystal. Um, silicon is really unique, as you might know. It has this transition where uh, a near about 114K it goes from a positive uh, thermal expansion to a negative thermal expansion. So from a theoretical standpoint, that's not really well understood. So we try to I hope to uh, inform on that. We're also doing germanium measurements. Those are exactly the same, but with the germanium crystal. Um, it improves our sensitivity in both cases. Um, it improves our fit force limits or will improve our fit force limits by a little bit, not orders of magnitude, which is why the line is very close to the other one. We've actually also started this. We've taken our first pendulosa measurement. However, unfortunately, uh, the reactor went down. So we haven't been able to follow up. We do have a completed measurement of the 1 1 run for germanium. Uh, it's a wing for the interferometry part of that, too. Um, that's on hold up and uh, for a bit. We hope to complete that this year. Um, OK, so collaboration actually for a neutron interferometry is, experiment is pretty big. Uh, we usually don't run with this many people. Uh, but this is a complicated uh, experiment that has involved a lot of people's outside work. I like to highlight the younger people on this. Uh, we have two current grad students. Oh, this is, uh oh, I'm out. How do I get back? I don't even know how that's. There's three buttons here, and I did something that was not on any of the buttons. All right, so let me go back to the collaborators because I want to give them credit.
like I was saying, we have uh, two graduate students who are working on each of the individual aspects, the measuring it with germanium and the measuring it with, um, uh, that's Taku who's measuring it with germanium. He's from Japan and Robert Valdez, who is at NC State and he's measuring the um, higher order structure factors. And again, Ben Heacock, uh, who started as a student has since gone on, he has been the primary driver of this work. I mean, he started from the beginning uh, he's developed the collaboration and basically uh, runs this program. I just get to have the fun part of trying to tell you about it. So, and with that, I'm, I'm basically done. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Plenty of time for discussion. Yeah. Oh, maybe the other. No, no, please. No, no. Okay. No, and gravity is, so the, the single crystal neutron interferometer work started in the US measuring gravity. It's this thing that we're very familiar with, at least little g, measuring the local gravitational field. Um, but no, it's not an effect on our system because uh, it's just not an effect. So we don't have to worry about it. We're not tilting the crystal in that way. It would be an effect if you were rotating, if you had the Bragg like it's it's normally horizontal, right? And if you're tilting it this way, then it's your large effect. But we're tilting it like this. So it's not, we don't have to worry about it. But it is an effect that you can see an interferometer and we do see an interferometer uh, if, we're, if we're designing our experiment for that. It's a real, real thing, so. Bill. So let's assume you can do, you, you can start off with a completely monochromatic source. Mm -hmm. Which, I mean, obviously, you can make it more monochromatic, but you don't need flux. <laughs> but let's imagine that yeah. you, if you had a monochromatic source, then uh, how would that, uh, what would things look like then? I mean, presumably, everything would be cleaner, but in what way? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, I mean, it's a good question. It's not one I've thought about because we don't have a monochromatic source. I mean, you still want, in the case of Bragg diffraction, if, if it's monochromatic, but it does have divergent, which our sources are divergent because we're not lasers, um, then you would get the same results. Now, if you're totally monochromatic and uh, and have you know perfect column collimation, um, you never have perfect collimation because your crystal is only so big, mm -hmm. and so just the uh, Fourier transform thing says there's a certain amount of of uh, angular spread just because the crystal is. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's an interesting. Uh, it's an interesting thought experiment. Yeah, I haven't thought too much in that extreme. Mm -hmm. So, but then when you tilt even a little bit to left or right, it starts to, there's like an asymmetry point kind of get drawn towards the point. Why is it kind of like, like it's like bounce you know, one way more than the other? Right. It is a preferential treatment for it to go out to the edge of the Borman fan, right? Um, so, I don't know how to explain that differently. Um, I have a very basic question. So, uh, neutron doesn't have a charge. That's right. So, yeah. so how, how, what kind of possibilities it, it makes uh, when you're thinking of material images? Okay, so for um, it was flashed on a slide, but maybe you should repeat the question for the internet. Oh, yeah, that's true. I'm sorry, I forgot that I can't hear the questions. 
So the, the, the question I think was that, how can you use the neutron electron scattering as an informant to material studies, right? It's very different than what I'm used to with the microbial synthesis electricity. Yes. Uh -huh. Now it's not. So it's not very, very different than the usual uh, light matter interaction that we are used to. Right. So how is it different than X-ray and what are the possibilities that we cannot have like for example, for reading the magnetic order in the system, um, how neutron scanners are so neutron scanners are very really good for magnetic ordering and stuff like that because it does have this magnetic dipole moment. It's less sensitive to like surface effects, so that they do uh, there is a field of neutron reflectometry in which they're basically taking a neutron at a very large glancing angle and reflecting off just the surface layers. And that can tell you material properties about the surface layers. Um, but for the bulk, right, you're not interacting with the electric fields. It's only, uh, if you're looking for electric magnetic interaction, it's always through the magnetic dipole moment. So. Mike? Yes, Bill. So one of the magical properties of neutrons is this fact that the inhibitory attraction for a lot of materials is negative. Yes. Uh, so that, that's what allows you to make these guides with, with the uh, total reflection. Yep. So how widespread is that? Uh, that is, are there materials that have uh, a positive index? Uh, <laughs> what makes that? Is, 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 can I understand it just by looking at difference in scattering length? The sign of scattering length of the nuclei that are in there. Right. You can look at the sign of the scattering length, although you have to be a little bit cautious because, like in hydrogen, the scattering length is negative. However, most of the scattering you see off hydrogen is actually incoherent scattering, which is a whole different number. And so when you're scattering, you might think, well, I can make a nice negative potential with that. But in reality, it doesn't serve a good purpose because you get a lot of just immense incoherent scattering. Uh, uh, with the hydrogen, you know, it, it has to do with the facts, I believe it's because the, uh, it's a simple two nuclei, uh, um, um, to the two isospins. So it, in the hydrogen case, right, you just have the nucleus. So it has isospin one or, or in the, and for the neutron, it has the other. And so it's just the interaction. It's like a maximally interacting incoherently because it matters whether it's you know the neutrons the hydrogen is not polarized so the neutrons can come in like this or this and the interaction just is basically completely yeah, incoherent pair of zero and one of those yeah yeah so, yes yes yeah, yeah yeah but yeah. So, so many uh, neutral eating properties are helping investigate the, uh, the subversion of dynamic space and the geometric space so have you able to look at it? I have not done personally experiment that really separated that geometric and dynamical phase. Uh, it's tricky <laughs> because the geometric phase is like, uh, I did put a geometric factor in one of my equations, but that has to do with the phase associated with the slip placement and stuff like that. So that's like a, just a physical artifact of the apparatus setup. Um, there are ge geometric phases, which are basically purely quantum mechanical, which has to do with like the evolution of like the neutron spin as it's passing through the interferometer. Um, those are beautiful experiments and have been done with the neutron interferometer, but I have not done them personally. So we haven't looked into that. <laughs>